Bethel, Capellan March, Federated Sons, 14 April, 3029. Both Valkyries launched LRM volleys at the Vindicator. Missiles blasted up and down the PPC's barrel, stripping it of armor and exposing the glowing blue charging coils. Five missiles smashed into the Vindicator's left breast, blasting the armor hatches protecting LRM launch tubes off the mech's chest, but failed to do more serious damage. Two other explosions gouged deep wounds into the armor of the mech's right leg, but the armor remained unbreached. After countless discussions about battle mechs over the years, I've noticed there are few that have as positive a reputation as the Valkyrie. It's curious as one can usually find plenty of naysayers for most designs. While I'm sure there are already some contrarians that are running to the comments section of this video to explain to me that the Valkyrie is trash, that hasn't been my experience up to this point. Today's mission with the Valkyrie is to see if we can sort out why this plucky 30-ton mech has such a good reputation both in-universe and among players. The truth is out there, folks. The story of the Valkyrie begins at the end of one of humanity's most brutal interstellar civil wars. The dust had barely settled from the conflict between the Star League Defense Force and the armies loyal to Stefan Ameris when the call went out for bids to rebuild. The ultimate fate of the Star League was still very much in question, so many were preemptively seeking to build new battle mechs that might grant an edge in any future conflict, or at least profit from it. Corian Enterprises, based out of New Avalon, was the third largest producer of military equipment and technology at this point. Their leadership understood the opportunity was there to provide the Star League with a new battle mech that could fill the ranks of the depleted SLDF. The Valkyrie QA was proposed and commissioned by the SLDF. Unfortunately, corporate legal wrangling delayed production when the Harvard company claimed that Corian's design was ripped off from their WASP land air mech. The question would go unanswered as the collapse of the Star League in the beginning of the First Succession War made such things seem trivial. The first Valkyries marched from the production lines on New Avalon in 2787, just one year into the First Succession War. From that point, due to the planet's geography and the fact that it was the capital of the Federated Suns, the battle mech became closely associated with House Davion. Most of the production would end up in the armed forces of the Federated Suns, and where it was seen elsewhere, at least for a time, it was picked up as salvage. Later on in the timeline, Valkyries would be found among the other successor states and within the militaries of the periphery states, including the Calderon Protectorate, Viltvelt Coalition, and Franck Reaches. Ducal State, Caspar, Vendril 1, Lyran Commonwealth, 27 December, 2999. Just then the whole OP shook. A loud crash and a pounding sound caused Jed to look behind them. A ranger's phoenix hawk was stomping through the camp to reach the southern perimeter and assist the struggling griffin. Jed found having a 45-ton, 10-meter-tall mech stepping just a few meters away from him to be a humbling experience, to say the least. Just then, another loud roar spun his head back around to the south in time to see the griffin ignite its jump jets and soar away from the attacking Victor and Thunderbolt to get some time to recover from the damage that had scarred the mech's torso and destroyed its left arm. After the Griffin touched down, a ranger's Valkyrie flew overhead on its jump jets and landed with a ground-shaking thud near the wounded Griffin. The Valkyrie's pilot loosed a flight of ten long-range missiles that peppered the Thunderbolt's right side. The popping sounds and bright flashes pulled the attention of both attacking mechs from the wounded Griffin to the newly arrived Valkyrie. Those first years were a boon for Korean Enterprises, as the company tried to ramp up production to meet demand. At the time, the forces of the Draconis Combine were hammering Federated Suns planets along their shared border, and the AFFS was frantically buying up every piece of military technology they could to try to bolster their defensive lines. One report stated that the factory on New Avalon was eventually able to produce nearly 200 Valkyries in a single year. But why was this mech in such great demand? Let's take a look. Weighing in at 30 tons, the Valkyrie QA was on the heavier end of the light mech category. Built around a Korean Model 1AA steel chassis and an Omni 150 fusion engine, the mech named after the winged warriors of ancient Norse mythology was not able to keep up with most light mechs in a foot race. However, the Norse Industries 3S jump jets did the mech's name justice by allowing it to leap up to 150 meters at a time. 160 meters if leaping off the back of an atlas while the mech warrior screams something about Valhalla. 
As with all Battlemech designs, the Valkyrie was a demonstration of opportunity cost. While many light mechs rely upon speed to survive at the cost of weaponry and armor, Korean went a different direction with the Valkyrie and it has paid off. The six tons of Reese 470 standard armor was double the protection of a Wasp or Stinger, and even still a little bit more than some 35 ton battle mechs like the Venom. This made the Valkyrie a much tougher target for anti-light mech operations. The added protection was appreciated by mech warriors who lauded the design. Of course, it's important to note that the Valkyrie wasn't just another light scout mech. It was envisioned as an agile light fire support mech that could hit way above its weight due to its weapons loadout. The original QA design carried a Sutel 9 medium laser, which isn't too unusual for a light mech from this time. However, the Devastator Series 7 Long Range Missile 10 system allowed the Valkyrie to fire from range and even deliver fire indirectly while remaining safely behind cover. Working together with other Valkyries or heavier fire support mechs, the Valkyrie paid for itself quickly. With 11 heat sinks, the QA could move and shoot consistently without worrying too much about overheating. Overall, the mech is a solid generalist design that can do well so long as you stay on the move and avoid targets moving into that LRM minimum range. It was easy to maintain without any wacky specialty parts, and the Lynx Sure communication system had a great reputation for quality and performance. The critics of the Valkyrie often bring up two shortcomings of the design. The first is the mech's speed. If not careful, the Valkyrie can be chased down by their light mechs and rendered into scrap as it only has a medium laser with which to defend itself. The other issue highlighted was the single ton of ammunition for the LRM-10. Having only 12 shots limited the offensive capabilities of the mech in an extended fight, and it tied it to logistics lines for resupply. While neither of these arguments can be considered anything close to a fatal flaw, knowing the mech's shortcomings can save a mech warrior's life. The first deployments of the Valkyrie were rough, not for any inherent issue with the battle mech, but because the Federated Sons were rapidly approaching the breaking point in their logistics lines. Valkyries were often shipped directly from the factory to front lines without time for such formalities as receiving official unit paint colors. Holovids showing Valkyries fighting in factory primer were red meat for DCMS intelligence collectors who saw it as a sign of a waning Davion war effort. On the other hand, the Valkyries' actual performance in the field was stellar. Mech warriors appreciated it, and beyond some minor technical issues, the mech proved to be a solid quality producer. Reports from some planets that fell under combined control show that the Valkyrie was an effective tool for Davion insurgencies as it was able to strike from distance and cover without having to take the risk of moving into enemy fire. It was also cheap enough that risks could be taken on missions where its loss would not be catastrophic for a guerrilla group's efforts, whereas a loss of a heavier fire support mech would have been catastrophic. During the first Battle of Galtor, the DCMS saw firsthand how powerful the Valkyrie could be when working together. The Proserpina Hussars expected a quick victory when they assaulted Galtor, but instead they were dragged into a three-month battle of attrition with the planetary defenders, the Sirtis Fusiliers. Outnumbered and worn down from repeated assaults, the Fusiliers made the most of what they had, which just so happened to include a significant number of Valkyries. The nimble defenders were able to quickly move and direct fire support LRM fire wherever it was needed, which repeatedly disabled and hampered the DCMS attacks. One of the noted strengths in the battle reports was the low attrition rate for the Fusilier's light mechs under fire. The most famous Valkyrie pilot has to be Justin Allard. Though the legendary Solaris mech warrior would be best known for piloting the Yen Lo Wang variant of the Centurion, he spent his early days within the Federated Sun's armed forces piloting a VLK QA Valkyrie. Though it was a stock configuration, Allard developed his skills and pushed the machine to its limits. In one notable battle, Allard piloted his Valkyrie into a duel with Grey Noten, a legendary mech warrior in his own right. The mismatch between the 30-ton Valkyrie and the 60-ton Rifleman proved too much for Allard's battle mech, but only after causing significant damage to the armor of the heavy opponent. Justin started running his Valkyrie to the right, grinning as his battle display showed him the lumbering rifleman's attempt to follow his movement. In the effort, the big mech's waist locked so that it had to make an almost comical shuffle step to continue turning. Perfect, Justin told himself. Just a bit faster and I'll be in the clear. He grinned even wider and dropped his missile targeting crosshairs onto the rifleman's silhouette. He kept it there, despite the pounding, jarring strides that carried his mech forward. But wait, what was that pilot doing? Justin felt terror flash through his guts as the rifleman stopped trying to track his Valkyrie. 
The larger machine stood rock still for a moment, then twisted back in the other direction. As it did so, the Capellan mech's arms swung up toward the sky and back down to lock in the rear firing arc. No! Justin twisted his Valkyrie violently to reorient it and tried valiantly to fire the jump jets. These frantic efforts only managed to trip up the Valkyrie, and he had to fight hard to regain control of the falling mech. Though Justin Allard would move on toward a separate destiny, his heavily damaged Valkyrie was salvaged and returned to service. It was even eventually upgraded to the newer variant and was recorded as in active service with the AFFS for nearly 40 years before it was ultimately destroyed along with the unit it belonged to in a Blakist attack in 3068. Speaking of variants, there have been quite a few official variants of the Valkyrie over the years, though it's worth noting that the first official variant didn't arrive until 3049. It's a testament to the viability of the original Valkyrie QA that it remained in production for more than 200 years. Now before you yell at me, yes, the Valkyrie QF is a thing, but I consider it more of a field refit as the only change to the mech was to pull that medium laser and swap it with a flamer. That 3049 variant, like so many others in the 20 years before the clan invasion, was substantial thanks to the technology developed as a result of the discovery of the Helm Memory Core. By this point, the Valkyrie was found in every Federated Sons unit and in smaller numbers in the other Great House militaries. As effective as the mech had been, it was showing its age in comparison to the newer light class battle mechs. When the Federated Sons joined the Lyran Commonwealth to create the Federated Commonwealth, the updated variant of the Valkyrie was wrapped up in an effort to unify the two armed forces into a single entity. Part of that was meshing command structure, but on a very practical level, it involved sharing technology and a back and forth exchange to homogenize military units. As a result, this introduced many Lyrans to the Valkyrie. Redesigned from the ground up, the Valkyrie QD was constructed from Korean Model 101 AA endosteel, which bought mass at the price of valuable internal space. The Omni 150 fusion engine was retained, but the number of heat sinks was dropped to just 10 single instead of the original 11. There are still six tons of armor, but it was upgraded to the Star Guard Civ Ferrofibrous, which provided the machine with 108 points of protection instead of the original 96. The jump jets were retained, though due to the Combine's assault and capture of the production lines on Marduk during the Fourth Succession War, the Norse Industries 3S jump jets would need to be replaced with an equivalent set of Model 12s from Hildco. Thankfully, the performance was equivalent to the original option. As was so common for this era's upgrades, the standard medium laser in the right arm was swapped out for a pulse laser version. The Sutel Precision Line medium pulse laser enjoyed improved accuracy at the cost of range. In some cases, this can be a negative on mechs that really need to perform in the mid-range, however for the Valkyrie, it usually wants to keep its distance, with the laser really only being there for emergencies. With that in mind, the medium pulse laser makes sense. In the left torso, the traditional LRM-10 is still there, but it's upgraded with an Artemis IV fire control system to improve missile accuracy. There's still only one ton of ammunition for the LRM launcher, which is a bit of a letdown. Finally, a case was added to the right torso to keep that LRM ammunition from killing the mech and the mech warrior in an ammunition explosion. Overall, the Valkyrie QD is a bit of a cutie, and unlike some of the 3050 TRO upgrades, the technology added makes sense. Even if I'd rather switch back to a standard medium laser and add a second ton of LRM ammunition to the mech, but that's just nitpicking. It's a good variant and definitely one worth taking out into the field. The Cedars, or Geese, 19 July 3055. This is Pursuit 1. I have a visual on three Masakare class Omnis at approximately 600 meters. They are just crossing over, as Rose listened and watched the Valkyrie on top of the parking garage, two azure beams suddenly cut across the sky. One PPC beam passed by the Valkyrie's right shoulder, but the other struck the mech squarely in the face. The force of the blast cut neatly through the armor, the skeleton, the electronics, and the flesh underneath. With energy to spare, the beam blasted out of the back of the Valkyrie's head and into the night sky. The mech froze for a moment as if stunned by its own sudden death. Then it fell forward, draping itself over the edge of the roof. When the grand experiment that was the Federated Commonwealth fell apart in gloriously violent fashion, vast numbers of battlemechs were obliterated in the nasty civil war. 
Production lines in Davion Space, including the lines on New Avalon, were repurposed to produce heavier battle mechs first, which left many Fed Suns units short on light mechs. This resulted in less effective scouting efforts and more than a few tactical complications where battlefield commanders were acting on incomplete information. Eventually, the frantic calls for additional light mechs shifted production back toward more traditional numbers. Korean Enterprises took this opportunity to upgrade the QD Valkyrie again in 3067 with what would be labeled the QD-1. It retained the endosteel but downgraded back to standard armor in favor of going with an XL engine instead and 10 double heat sinks. The lower mass of the engine allowed for the upgrade from the LRM-10 to an LRM-15 with Artemis IV fire control systems. The medium pulse laser was pulled and replaced with an ER medium laser and a targeting computer. I suspect that your feelings for the QD-1 are going to depend upon your risk aversion as that XL engine really does make the Valkyrie a little squishier in favor of improving the weaponry. At least it has two tons of LRM ammunition now. Generally, I'm not a big fan of the QD-1 and prefer the original QD to it. Boy, saying QD a bunch sure is fun. Okay, one more time. QD. We're going to have to leap ahead a bit for our next variant, the Valkyrie QT-2. QT. Okay, so here we go. First spotted in 3081, this Valkyrie boldly sports a larger XL engine, additional jump jets, and 10 double heat sinks. The new movement profile is 7117, which addresses the question about the mech's speed, though it does pay for that with additional vulnerability. Armed with a light PPC in the right arm and a streak SRM-6 in the right torso, the Valkyrie QT-2 looks much more like a traditional scouting light mech. The light PPC is nice for hitting out to 18 hexes for 5 damage, but with that 3 minimum range, it may not work extremely well with the streak SRM-6. Unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the QT-2 because it moves too far away from what made the Valkyrie unique in exchange for a role in which many other light mechs can fit better. It would be a bit like taking the PPC out of the Panther and giving it a couple of medium lasers instead. Is it still a Panther at that point? Hopping down the timeline a little further, the Valkyrie finally receives a light engine treatment with the QDD variant. The new engine boosts the mech's movement profile to 696, along with its sixth jump jet. It also has an XL gyro to buy one ton of mass with the cost of two critical hit locations in the center torso. Ten double heat sinks keep the QDD cool and six tons of ferrofibrous armor are the Valkyrie standard by this point. The Valkyrie QDD is armed with an ER medium laser in the right arm and an LRM-10 aided by an Artemis IV fire control system in the left torso. The one ton of LRM ammunition in the right torso is protected by a case. While it definitely fits the theme of the Valkyrie and its loadout, a lot of technology went in to boost its speed slightly and to make it modestly more powerful. My concern would include the cost of this battle mech becoming prohibitive for widespread adoption, as well as the increased vulnerability of the light engine and the XL gyro. Our last official variant takes us to Stuart, recently conquered by the Wolf Empire. When the Wolves set up shop, they sought to make the most of the local industry, which was substantial, this included a line that was producing the Valkyrie. Instead of converting it entirely over to the production of a clan design, a hybrid Valkyrie, designated the Valkyrie C, was developed. After years of producing designs that never really took off, the Korean Enterprise's leadership were eager to see their mech with new clan technology. Built on a standard Korean Model 1AA steel structure and given an Omni Intersphere Tech 150XL engine, some space is saved and some is eaten up. The XL Gyro makes another appearance as well, saving that one ton of mass. Rawlings improved 75i jump jets help the Valkyrie C leap up to 240 meters and gives the mech a 588 movement profile. The 10 double heat sinks are inner sphere tech, but the five tons of ferrofibrous armor are at least clan grade to save on critical locations. A clan medium pulse laser fills that right arm spot where the laser typically goes, and a clan LRM-10 sits in the left torso. The two tons of ammunition, Yes! Finally, two tons for that LRM-10, after hundreds of years, and it's protected by Case 2 as well, not too shabby. The Valkyrie C was well-designed and benefited from an easy-to-maintain quirk, as well as improved communications. Apparently, it's a mech that was given to Salama troops, which makes sense. It's just inner sphere enough not to be able to compete with newer clan light mechs, but good enough to serve in the second and third rank forces, or even to export to those who will pay high prices for clan tech gear. Dan jetted the Valkyrie from the mech bay, targeting the panther that had shot Brant's commando. 
With the gold crosshairs of his missile targeting system on the Panther's open left flank, he stabbed the launch button with the thumb of his left hand. Flight away! The 10 LRMs spiraled directly in on target, their explosions eating through the Panther's chest like a cancer. They shredded armor, surrounding the fusion engine, and crushed the gyro. Short-circuited relays fired the Panther's jump jets. The mech rose 100 meters in an ion cloud, then exploded and released the fusion engine's artificial sun to dispel Pacifica's dark night. Pondering the Valkyrie C made me wonder what an official 2C version of the mech might look like. After some tinkering and briefly flirting with the plasma rifle loadout, I settled on something I think that fits the theme with the Valkyrie well, but ramps everything up to 11. Behold the MechFrog Hypothetical Valkyrie 2C. 30 tons of sass and fury, this mech benefits from Clan Endo Steel, 5.5 tons of ferrofibrous armor, and an XL engine that pushes the movement profile to 711. A seventh jump jet allows the 2C to leap up to that seventh hex as well. 10 Clan double heat sinks will keep the mech cool in all but the most heated of disagreements. Now for the fun stuff. In the left torso, the set-piece weapon is an improved ATM-6 launcher. The improved version of the weapon functions like a streak missile system, though the IATM can make use of indirect fire. When doing so, it functions like a standard LRM missile launcher. Putting the IATM launcher on the Valkyrie will maximize the two tons of ammunition placed on the mech. While on the record sheet, included in the video comments, by the way, I added the extended range and high explosive version of the missiles, the improved ATM launchers can also carry improved mag pulse rounds and improved inferno munitions as well if you're feeling particularly savvy. Case was also added to the right torso to keep the ammunition safe until you can deliver it to all the mech warriors who deserve it. Backing up the IATM-6 are a medium pulse laser in the right arm and an ER medium laser in the left arm. The combination of the two gives the mech warriors some options for range and accuracy in the mid and short ranges. Finally, a micro pulse laser located in the head can aid with infantry, battle armor, or close range conflict resolution. The 10 double heat sinks do a good job of keeping the mech cool under most running conditions. Under extreme duress, after jumping seven hexes and alpha striking with the missile lock, the 2C MF would end up at 21 heat before sinks. That's just plus one over your ability to sink it all away. Unless you're standing in a pool of lava while eating ghost pepper nachos, you're not gonna be overheating in this mech. With this design, the hypothetical Valkyrie 2C addresses both the shortcomings of the original battle mech. It's faster, can jump farther, and now has enough ammunition to remain dangerous for longer. What more could you ask for? So why do we love the Valkyrie? Besides its reputation for being an agile yet tough classic light battle mech that lives outside the normal stock weaponry, well, perhaps it's the connection to the lore or your love of all things House Davion. If not, let's settle on some solid variants and persisting value, even though so many of the other Inner Sphere Light Max face challenges moving into the 3050s. The Valkyrie is a great battle mech with a great name. For all this and more, I think we can say we love the Valkyrie. Do you have a favorite Valkyrie variant? Have you had luck with it on the tabletop or in Mega Mech? Let me know in the comments and we'll keep the discussion going. Thank you so much for coming by today as we talked Battletech. This year has been incredible for the growth of the channel, and I owe it all to you, the viewers who stuck around long enough to hear these words. I am blessed, and I value every opportunity to make these videos for you. If I don't get to see you again before the new year, I hope you finish 2023 strong, happy, and healthy. Take care, and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.